many of you, any of you in engineering know that that was a product widely used in commercial and uh, particularly in greenhouse areas. Uh, the walls and benches and things of a greenhouse were all built from transite. The way to fit that, of course, is to saw it. When you saw it, you get the dust of both the concrete but asbestos as well. And so it was outlawed, could no longer be used, but there were supplies of it around the country and they flew that down and used it to build roofs for the schools. Uh, not saying it was wrong, it was a good use of a product that I know would stand up a heck of a lot longer than what they were using for, for roofing. But uh, interesting to think that we got rid of it for health reasons and take it down there and build schools out of it. But uh, once up, nobody would be cutting it, sawing it, the danger and risk would be pretty well over. Uh, the kids loved the schools. They, uh, they built desks for many of them. They built benches and a combination uh, desk in front of them, uh, long rows of those in many cases. The other thing that was lacking in almost every community were wells. And uh, in the year ahead and the early part of the second year that I was there, they had completed 16 of these wells, four inch to six inch diameter wells, and uh, had hooked them up. Uh, most of them had been hooked up with power pumps and so forth. One community that had had a well given to them a year before uh, wasn't using it, and we asked why. Well, who would pay for the electricity to run the pump? Now that's pretty poverty stricken when you can't afford to run a pump with potable, clear, fresh water in a community where the only water supply has got to be ditches and, and ponds that they can run into. Uh, as we drove the highway, it was potholes and, and terrible, terrible conditions. You'd have to have one wheel off on the edge in order for two cars to pass, one or, one or the other. Um, the holes, instead of repairing them like you think they would do, but putting material in the base and, and then uh, concrete or asbestos or some kind of mix on top, they took bags of sacrete and just dropped them into these big holes. And they'd, they'd swallow an entire dual wheel if they hadn't had something in them. You'd ruin a car trying to drive on that highway if you weren't careful. At any rate, uh, never added water. First truck over them, of course, broke or popped open that bag and then the dust and cement was all over the countryside. But in addition to that, there were uh, fence lines, a few fence lines, but mostly, again, these shrubs and brush that was growing up as potential firewood. And that was just lined with uh, plastic bags paper and tin cans and what have you. And my comment was, aren't these people proud enough of the area to go and clean that up? Oh, you completely misunderstand. Well, I said, it's awfully messy looking. Yeah, but they're through with it. They no longer need it. They hang it out there for somebody else that might need it. Now, I don't know. That's a satisfactory way of saying uh, they live with that condition all the time or not, but that's that's the truth. That's what they, they did. Uh, one of the interesting things to see in the community where this uh, screening clinic was taking place, it was also the center of a community. The only uh, machinery I saw of any sort was a mill in the center of that city. It had a little corn grinder that would grind that corn that the farmers would bring in, bring a sack of corn over their shoulder and and go give it to the mill and he'd grind that corn and they'd take it back as flour, very coarse flour. And uh, that's what they used for their tortillas and their cooking and so forth. Uh, but that mill was running constantly while we were there. A few pennies that it cost to get it ground was gladly given. But the kids themselves would catch locusts. When you got when we got off the helicopters, we wondered this high buzzing sound. It sounded like an electrical power line. It's 
all I could think of. It was a, it must be a real big power generator here someplace. These were locusts that were rubbing their wings on their hind legs. And it set up a, a horrendous noise. But the kids would catch them, and they really were the size of a, well, I, I would say the same as a hummingbird, virtually the same size as a hummingbird, a little bit smaller. But they tied a lightweight string around the body, made a little harness around it, and then let that out, and that thing would fly. That was like flying a kite. They'd reel them back in once in a while and then send them up again. And, uh, that was their amusement and fun. And I know that uh, the chattering went on like crazy. There was uh, congregate cooking that day for everybody that came to that area and had gone through their their uh, uh, their screening clinic. Once they were through, then they went over to this congregate area where everybody pitched in, brought things, and uh, had a, uh, a feast before they finished. They put on a, uh, a show for for the military, thanking them for what they were doing for these people. And it was very interesting. They gave uh, the commanding officer of the unit uh, one of their big sombrero hats with the inlaid uh, wording on it and so forth as a, as a gift. Uh, they made quite a ceremony of thanking the Americans for what they were doing. Uh, we were invited to the consulate, the woman, uh, Mrs. McAfee, Marion McAfee, was the uh, U.S. representative to Guatemala. She had a lovely home in the city of Guatemala, a uh, high fence around it, huge big iron doors, barbed wire across the top of the fence, highly secured, uh, armed soldiers around it. We were dropped off our bus in front of it, and we walked through those big iron doors that were openable to allow cars to go through into the house, and it was a very attractive place. The yard was long and deep, and at the back end of the yard was a viaduct that uh, was back from the Roman em Empire days when uh, uh, the Romans occupied that land. Uh, that was uh, uh, not a working viaduct anymore, but that was the backdrop of her lot and the contiguous lots to the side. Uh, still standing centuries after it was built. Uh, lovely yard, beautiful gardens, gorgeous lawn, and so forth. She was very gracious to us and, and invited us, but gave us a hell of a scolding before it was over with, saying, you people are harming these people down here in what you're doing. Well, this just blew my mind. When we're coming in there doing what we were doing, building schools, drilling wells, helping with their roads and bridges, and uh, conducting these screening clinics, what in God's world was she talking about when she said we're harming them? She had hired three Catholic nuns that uh, she had uh, brought over there to do humanitarian work. She says they will be here for years. What happens when you people leave? And she had a point there. I don't know what's happened since military left, because uh, I'm sure no, no other country has stepped up to take over where we left off. I doubt that that would have happened. Uh, they've at least had a taste of something better. And I think we still did a very fine job. One thing I failed to mention was that uh, at the end of the screening, wherever they went through that military screening area, they all went by the last station, and that was a deworming station, each given a big pill to swallow with some water. And uh, men, women, and children all were dewormed at the end of it. And I guess uh, with the diet that they're on, that's a very necessary thing. But uh, you, you can imagine no, you can't. Without seeing it, without knowing what it was, the taste of it must have been terrible. I, I've never seen such contorted faces in my life as when they swallowed that, that pill, but they got it down, and they had to open their mouth and show that they had swallowed it before they could get rid of it. 
you know, before they were discharged from it. But uh, uh, it was a humbling experience in many respects. It was interesting to know that we did some good. I don't care what the ambassador thought of our activity over there. There's no question in my mind, but what we did a lot of good and uh, opened the possibilities of what can be done with a modest amount of help if uh, people are willing to work for it. I'm sure that uh, a number of these people showed greater ambition and things after they saw the, the work ethic of our, of our people. Uh, most common thing in that country, of course, is their noontime siestas, which last for a couple of hours. Our military worked right through that, broke for half hour breaks for meals and back to work again. And, uh, anyway, I was proud of what we did. I think we've done an excellent job over there. I'm sure we did a lot of good. Any questions from any of you at all? It was quite an experience. There were 28 of us, as I said, that went there. We uh, all enjoyed it. We had uh, uh, Dan Ludwig, who was next uh, president of the American Legion that, the next year, mayor of uh, Rochester, Minnesota, one of our good professors up at Duluth, uh, the college. We had uh, uh, military personnel. We had walk of every life, I guess, in, in that group of 28, but it was a marvelous experience and one I was very pleased to be able to share. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Al, you want got something? people and young ladies here and uh, so maybe some of it will be uh, new to them. Hold that microphone by your mouth. Down, uh, down. I was a flight engineer in the uh, 8th Air Force and I flew 26 missions. Uh, our bomb group went over in early 42. Curtis LeMay took the group over. Uh, what I would thought I'd talk about is a little bit of luck that I had while I was flying these missions. We all had luck or we wouldn't be here. Uh, we, we were training in Gulfport and we were shooting touch and go land, landings on a B-17 and it was 7.10 in the evening, it was dark and we came in and uh, we were probably about 90 miles an hour when we stalled out and the wheels touched. The trouble was we had a malfunction in the landing gear and the wheels weren't there. So we bellied in, the oxygen system went up, everything was on fire. There was uh, the five skeleton crew, the two pilots, navigator, radio operator, myself, and then we also had a checkout pilot was that was checking uh, our pilot out on landings. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we all got out of the plane. The plane was destroyed completely. The fire from the oxygen really works real fast. Um, for two weeks after, we were on the firing line with the FBI, interviewing us individually in rooms because he thought we had sabotaged the plane. Just because the mount the gear now the gear showed everything showed the gear was down, but of course it wasn't. Um, also while we were down there, the uh, in the training they were flying these planes night and day so that they weren't get, getting service too much. Uh, we had three electrical fires in the air which we put out. We had a runaway prop, and if if you haven't had a runaway prop on a B-17, it you take off, you're doing 2,500 RPM with 46 inches of mercury, but in a hurry, that prop really goes. So I was lucky, slipped a 
on the amplifier in, and we went back to normal. Uh, on another takeoff, we had number four engine blow, and they told us that we had blown uh, seven pistons. That engine just literally fell apart. But with three other engines, why, of course, we did what a B-24 can do. We just proceeded to go out <laughs> and land again. <laughs> we left Savannah, Georgia, took our, a plane up to Goose Bay, Labrador, and after 10 days of laying around there, waiting for a 30 mile an hour speed, uh, 30 mile an hour tailwind, while we took off for Iceland. We were cruising at about 8,000 feet over the North Sea, and all of a sudden, well, you want to remember, we had de-icer boots, no fluid, also we had no oxygen. But at 8,000 feet, we're icing up, the ice is forming on, on the wings, and when that ice breaks loose, at three, four, five inches on the wings, why, it sounds like a hundred kids throwing rocks at you. It really scared the heck out of you. So we went up to 13,000 feet, and then the ice disappeared. Well, about an hour later, we started getting silly because we didn't have any oxygen. So we came back down to 6,000 feet, and we came over to Iceland. Uh, we landed uh, in a, we had a 60 mile an hour wind that we landed in. The day before, it had been 100 miles an hour. They get them up there, and they blow the airplanes away. So when we landed, they said uh, I should put somebody in the... Uh, waste because it's so windy. Well, I said, what for? He said, in case the plane blows away. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we got over to our bomb group, the 305, and on our first mission, it was a Dresden mission, and you know, everybody knows what happened on the fire bombing there. Well, we took off. It was a fly, a very, very uh, foggy day, so we were on instruments practically immediately. We took off. The next plane behind us uh, took, crashed into our barracks site, and I've got some pictures there. You can see what our barracks looks like after a RDX bombs wipe it out, because that's what they did. When we got home, I, we had to sleep in, in the church, so I got pretty religious. I'm a Jewish, and I'm a Protestant, and I'm a Catholic, because we couldn't talk when we were having services. Now, after this plane crashed, the next two planes taking off crashed outside the airbase. And that, not long ago, that was in the 8th Air Force magazine. But there was uh, 25 men killed in the three planes. One of my buddies was sleeping in a barracks when he was uh, killed. We had some of these, you're getting the idea about the luck. Uh, we had uh, two missions where we aborted. On one of them, a pilot, we had an excellent pilot, and he came back and we made a two wheel landing, beautiful landing, and we pulled to the end of the runaway and the plane, the right wheel blew up, just wiped out. So. If we'd have come in a little bit rough, I don't think I'd be here today, because we were carrying RDX bombs, and they're pretty, pretty wicked. Uh, one morning we came, I think I, some couple of years ago, I asked if anybody in this place had, uh, any of the group had uh, uh, heard of uh, Disney bombs. <coughs> At that time we had one person here. Well. We came out one morning to the plane, and the um, there was two external bombs hanging on the inboard on each side of the plane. They were called Disney bombs, 4,500 pounds each, and they had a steel nose charge and a rocket in the back end. And the idea that we flew at uh, 12, 13,000 feet when we dropped them, and the idea is that. After you get at an angle, the rocket kicks in. I never did find out if they uh, they were for submarine pens with 30 feet of concrete. So uh, they quit using them, so I don't think they were too good. 
but you can imagine a B-17 can't carry as much as a B-24. What, 9,000 pounds in your, you got your 6,800 rounds of ammunition, you got your fuel, everything. So now we use 6,000 feet of runway on both those takeoffs. And I was talking to the pilot last night in Salt Lake, and he said, yeah, he says, we were a little worried. <laughs> on my ninth mission, now rank, rank didn't mean much in the service. If you were an officer, uh, Colonel Craig, he was leading our group on my ninth mission, and his plane blew up in front of us, so at that time a colonel didn't mean much. Uh, On our 10th mission, we had taken off, and we were on our way to the target. And uh, this is luck again. The co-pilot's flying off of this plane here, so he's not looking over here at the pilot. And I was, in the of course, in the top turret, and I looked down, and the pilot was slumped over. He had passed out. His basket froze up, so I got I always carry, the engineer always carries extra parts, so forth. And uh, so I took his mask off and put another one on, shot him some oxygen, and he came out of it. Well, later on, uh, we went over the target, and we got hit pretty heavy in the nose. Navigator got wounded, so the bombardier was going to navigate us home. Well, he got us lost, so we're out of fuel. We're at 3,000 feet. We've got our parachutes on. We come out of the clouds, and right below us, we're over France. There's a fighter base. And so we, we landed. Well, that's a little bit of luck, too. Well, I, uh, we took the navigator in and uh, left him there because he was wounded. And so I, while we were eating, I had asked the ground crew of fighters whether if they would check the plane, see if it was okay to gas up and fly back home. So when I came out, they said, yeah, the plane's fine, and we put some gas in it, and so you can go. So we got home, and next day the crew chief chewed me out for bringing the plane back. The main right spire was shot in two, and we had a big chunk of flak hanging above number three in the fuel tank, above number three supercharger. So he blamed me for not doing a better job, but in the first place, it was pretty hard to see. You can't see inside of a wing. <coughs> on our 18th mission, we had number four engine on fire. Uh, uh, the co-pilot pulled a fire extinguisher, and it didn't work. So I went back in the waist. That flame was, it was way back behind the wing. It was really hot. So that really scared you. But um, the co-pilot took and uh, managed with the, with the cow flaps to put the fire out, which is, I think, pretty lucky. Uh, then we went to feather the prop, and the feathering line broke. So we had a windmilling prop, and we had fighters in the area, and we were flying about 100, 110 miles an hour just barely hanging through the air because that propeller is windmilling if you go any faster and it's just shaking the heck out of that airplane. So we managed to get home okay. Uh, on the 24th mission we went to the uh, rest home and um, we came back late at night. It was about 11 o'clock. Now we used to get up at uh, one o'clock in the morning, eat at breakfast at two, take off at 5.30. And so, uh, we got back late at 11 o'clock that night, and we were supposed to fly a mission the next day. So. They scrubbed us and, they, and replaced us. We were flying deputy lead, and they replaced us with another crew. Well, three jets 
hit hit the uh, group over the uh, over the target, and they sh killed one of the jet pilots. But this jet uh, 262 crashed into the plane and blew up the plane and replaced us. So that pretty much covers what I'm referring to as being lucky. I'm lucky to be here, and so are the rest of you. Very good. Drive here, pump six, seven, oct, noin, zane, el, so, 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 so,